I tried to make sure it was alive, and that entailed just looking at it. I could follow its eyes. I assumed they were eyes. They look like eyes. It's a really remarkable, very strange looking animal. Three hearts, blue blood, gills, and this entire body is covered in these remarkable color changing cells so the animal can camouflage itself in the blink of an eye. Based on its gut anatomy, it's a predator. It eats only meat. It's a short, simple gut. When I look at the brain, the brain's not that big. So I'm thinking, you know, so this is something that kills and eats other animals. Maybe it uses something other than its brain to really figure out what's what. Didn't look like it had a skeleton. So we were able to ask, does it have anything that looks like DNA that we would know? And it did. And as we analyzed the genome of the animal, it was about the size of a human genome. And the response was, oh, you've solved it. That must be the basis of how smart they seem, uh, how good they are at solving problems. We would hesitate to say that, but we're certainly very excited by this discovery. The reason I became fascinated with cephalopods is because they have the largest brains of invertebrates. Their design, if you look at it from 20 paces, looks like an invertebrate brain, but if you look at it in a microscopic cross-section, looks completely unlike that of any other invertebrate brain. It also looks much more complex, and it has not been studied at all with modern molecular and cellular techniques. The human genome has 3.2 billion letters in it. The octopus genome has about 2.7 billion, so it's almost as big as a human genome, but much, much bigger than the genomes of other invertebrates. Now that we know that it's big, we were able to go through and look at how many different genes it has. So when we did this, we actually found that they have a large number of genes that were thought to be uniquely expanded in animals like us. And this was really rather a surprise because this group of genes hadn't been found in animals outside of the vertebrates. So this was then our starting point to ask how a large brain could be organized and also how it could develop apart from the vertebrate design. So the Nature Paper was a multi-lab collaboration between our lab here, Dan Roxar's group at UC Berkeley and Okinawa. Dan Roxar's group sequenced the genome of our species, and our group, we sequenced the transcriptomes. That is, we looked at um, the specific RNAs in different tissues. And by combining our data, we're really able to come up with a more powerful way of understanding what makes the octopus genetically unique. One of the really most gratifying things about publishing the genome paper was that there was such an enormous response to it. Um, people got really excited about these animals that, you know, they're quite cool, but I don't think people think about very often. Cliff said this once, <laughs> and it's haunted us ever since. We will not, hopefully in our lifetimes, have uh, intelligent aliens land, but if they did, they almost surely would not offer themselves up for experimental neuroscience. So we would not have the ability to ask how could an intelligent brain be organized apart from vertebrates by doing anything else except looking around at the great diversity of the animal world and what will you then zero in on are cephalopods. I've always been interested in how you make a weird animal. Um, and octopuses are essentially the weirdest animals that I could get my hands on. To me, I mean, if an animal modifies its behavior based on past experience, it shows evidence of learning. And is it intelligence? Well, it's not thinking about the conceptual implications of its change in behavior. It's saying, what's the best means to an end based on what I know? If you're a soft-bodied animal with no bones, you want to spend a lot of time hiding because uh, other animals will eat you. Um, even if you're as strong and ferocious as an octopus. But Scooty was incredibly gregarious, so he would come out when he noticed us come in. He definitely had a sense of humor, I would say, or mischievousness. Scooty was a lot of fun to have in the lab. Um, he very often spent a lot of time on the, the glass of the aquarium, just kind of checking things out and occasionally squirting water out of the aquarium to get people's 
attention. So we had these little uh, glass jars and we put fiddler crabs in them and then we would drop them into his tank and it was sort of a way of enrichment and, and challenging him uh, to get his food. Ultimately, uh, he realized that the cap uh, could move and uh, was able to pop it off and, and get the crab inside of it. Intelligence is such a tricky term because it's incredibly context specific and I find that really hard to apply to our animals. Even though we can see them do things that we can do. For example, uh, opening a jar. Oh, and if octopuses lived 100 years and had overlapping generations, so mom octopuses taught their babies all she knows, and the babies remembered, and as they grew, they learned more and more, human society would be in big trouble. It may be better to say that if they lived longer, they would rule the world. But that's a very land-centric view. Cephalopods do, in many ways, rule the world in the marine environment, which is most of the world. Octopuses seem almost otherworldly. Their behavior, their bodies, they're just completely different. I think the thing that we learned from the genome is how very similar they are to other animals. We see that they have the same complement of genes that other invertebrates have. They just use them very differently. 